and thank you for standing by. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer portion of today's conference. To ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn your conference over to Mr. Dave Stites. Sir, you may begin. Thanks, Julie, and good day, and thanks, everybody, for joining us for today's NASA Low-Density Supersonic Decelerator, or LDSD, post-test flight media call. I'm Dave Steets from NASA Headquarters Office of Communications in Washington. In a moment, we're going to hear from our LDSD experts who will talk about yesterday's great test. First, some housekeeping notes. This call is being recorded and will be available for instant replay by dialing 800 395 7443. I'll repeat that number at the end of the call. We've also posted to the web some short videos that our speakers are going to be talking to during this call. To view the videos, the URL is http colon slash slash go.usa.gov slash numeric nine capital F capital B capital G. I'll repeat that. It's http colon slash slash go.usa.gov slash numeric nine capital F capital B capital G. So that's go.usa.gov slash nine F B G. As our speakers talk to the videos, they'll announce which one they're playing and that they're looking at and you'll be able to follow along with them. Following remarks by our speakers, we'll take questions from journalists online. If you have a question, please hit star 1, and you'll be added to the Q&A queue. Again, star 1 if you have a question. Our speakers joining us today from the U.S. Navy's Pacific Missile Range facility on Kauai, Hawaii, are Dorothy Rasco, our Deputy Associate Administrator for the Space Technology Mission Directorate for NASA Headquarters in Washington, Dr. Mark Adler, the LDSD Project Manager for NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California, and Dr. Ian Clark, the LDSD Principal Investigator, also from JPL. We'll now hear from our speakers about yesterday's test. Dorothy? Uh, thank you, Dave. Hey, good morning. If you're on the West Coast, and good afternoon if you're on the East. I mean, this is an absolutely fantastic work by the team. I'm just super excited to um, talk with you guys this morning. Yesterday we saw another NASA first. It's the first test flight of an amazing new technology that will enable, enable future exploration. I want to thank all of the folks that helped to make this a successful test, especially to the Pacific Missile Range Facility and the LDSD team. This has been a long journey, and I am so super proud of this team. Getting the liftoff, drop, ignition, burn, flight to target speed and altitude, and the supersonic aerodynamic decelerator inflation to all work is fantastic. Recovering the vehicle and data recorders is amazing and will provide the opportunity to learn. Considering the complexity of the flight and our knowledge that parachute inflation is always a huge uncertainty, this is a terrific outcome. LDSD success reminds us of what NASA does. We take on hard technical problems and we solve them. This is why we test, to learn, and this is how NASA builds the foundation and capability to explore. We took technical risks yesterday in Hawaii to reduce the risk of landing on Mars tomorrow. This is a proud moment for NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate, the LDSD team, and explorers everywhere. We are succeeding in building the tools we need for discovery and exploration. We will begin testing composite tanks next week, testing more entry, descent, landing next summer, in addition to the testing of advanced solar electric propulsion. We have seven flights in 24 months where LDSD was the first to be accomplished. The work continues. Technology drives exploration. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the real expert, project manager, Dr. Mark Adler. Hi, thank you, Dorothy. I'm really, really happy to be here today to talk about yesterday's experimental test flight. Um, this flight has been in the making for more than three years by an amazing team of people at our NASA centers at JPL, Wallace Flight Facility, Langley Research Center, and Ames Research Center, and uh, several great companies that are building our, our rocket motors and our technologies for us and our core structure. Uh, very importantly, also, the Navy's Pacific Missile Range Facility here on Kauai has provided tremendous support while we've been out here. We designed and built and flew a first-of-its-kind 15-foot diameter Mach 4 test vehicle going up to 200,000 feet at the edge of space. It worked 
Beautifully, absolutely beautifully. Yesterday was just a great day. So I'm going to go ahead and play the pre-launch preparations video. And this, uh, what we're seeing here is them laying out the balloon. We had to carry this vehicle up on a very, very large helium balloon. This is a scientific balloon used normally to carry astrophysics telescopes. So here they have the balloon being rolled out of the box. They pull it out in this uh, red plastic wrapper that protects the balloon. They take that red wrapper off when they inflate it. This is 5,000 pounds of plastic that's made under very, very careful quality control conditions to make sure that this balloon can't burst or break and lift the vehicle up to very high altitudes with 34 million cubic feet of helium when it's finally at altitude. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and play the uh, next video, which is the balloon launch after we um, after we got the balloon laid out, and it took us about uh, about half an hour, about 45 minutes to inflate the balloon and load it up with helium. Here we have the balloon being released. We see that the bubble of helium is really mostly in the top of the balloon. The balloon fills out when it gets to altitude. The balloon comes up. You see the tower there. The balloon rises, and you see the uh, recovery parachute there and the tower. And the vehicle just there, you can see a little bit. You see the vehicle on the tower. Now you get a close-up view. There's the vehicle on the tower, and it's just about to cut loose, and it cuts loose from the tower and lifts straight up and out and away. And that's, it's, been, it's been several years to get to this point where you get, got this thing launched. Everybody is very happy about that. And then it was carried up to altitude. So I'll go ahead and uh, play the next video. That ascent then took about two hours for it to float out over the Pacific Ocean and get to 120,000 feet. I'll play the video called Test Vehicle Powered Flight. And this is what we've been waiting for for all these years is to see this video, to see the vehicle be dropped and for the rocket motor to fire. So here we have a view from a distance, seeing the balloon in flight. We're now looking down at the vehicle from the balloon gondola. So we're seeing the vehicle below us. So the vehicle will drop away. That's, that's the top of the vehicle there. There it drops away. Now we're looking from a vehicle camera at the rocket motor firing. That's a Star 48 motor firing and accelerating the vehicle up. You see the Earth spinning in the background because the vehicle is spinning for stability for that rocket motor to get it going in the right direction. So at that point, the vehicle rocketed up to around 200,000 feet at more than Mach 4. We received all of the telemetry from the flight that we were expecting. Uh, it was a fully successful execution of all of the events that had to occur on the vehicle. This was a test flight of the vehicle to make sure that we could actually get this vehicle to the conditions we wanted, make sure we can get the data back to make sure we can recover the information we wanted. All of those objectives were, were successful. The vehicle landed in the water where it was later recovered uh, along with the parachute and the image recorder and the balloon envelope. We picked up everything uh, that we wanted to get and more. The test was 100% success, plus we got extra credit for also testing a side and a parachute on this first, uh, first test flight. We were planning to do those tests next year, but we got them on the flight this year for an early test. Um, and Ian will talk more about those tests. Uh, the boats are just getting back now. We're going to go meet the boats at the port uh, right after this. Um, we've got tons of high-speed and high-resolution video that we're going to pull off to, to bring back. We've got a lot of other data to look at. We're going to spend the next several weeks analyzing this data in detail and understanding what happened on this flight so we can apply the lessons learned to the two flights that we have planned for next summer. So now I'll turn it over to, to Ian, the LDSD principal investigator. Thank you, Mark. So Mark mentioned that we had it because our vehicle flew so phenomenally well that we had a chance to shoot for some extra credit. And boy, did we get uh, just a ton of extra credit associated with this. Uh, the the cyan that we had that we were you know, really targeting for testing next year, but we were able to get onto this vehicle, uh, performed phenomenally, inflated extremely quickly, uh, very stable vehicle after it inflated, and then we had a, over a minute of solid flight time uh, and just gathering gigabytes and gigabytes of data on the performance of the cyan, and, and all the early indications are that it, that it was flawless. And so I'm going to uh, play the video that you'll see for the, that one. It's the LDSD test cyan deploy video. Uh, it's towards the end of the, the Star 48 motor burn. The Earth is rotating in the background. Uh, the vehicle is spun for stability. The motor burns out. And then we despin the vehicle using a, a pair of motors, and the vehicle just instantly stops. It's stunning how quickly that happened and how stable the vehicle was after that. And then shortly after the side inflates, boom, in a fraction of a second it goes from a very tightly stowed packed configuration to a fully inflated deployed uh, with about four, four and a half pressure uh, PSI, pounds per square inch, uh, internal pressure. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a, over 60 seconds of flight time on the side, just a, a tremendous amount of data. Uh, all indications are that the side performed uh, flawlessly. Uh, and we even got a bonus 
that we got to begin trying to, to test our parachute as well. Uh, for that, we had to develop an entirely new deployment technique. Uh, we developed a, a supersonic pilot uh, balut device, uh, the largest of its kind flown at these conditions. Uh, and so if I go to the video, the next video, you'll see what happens is we, we shoot the balut out of the back of the vehicle at 200 feet per second. Uh, the balut inflates, inflates very rapidly. Uh, and then a few seconds after that, the balut is used to extract the parachute off the back of the vehicle. Uh, the parachute that we're trying to, to test and get ready for next year, uh, testing more testing next year, is an enormous uh, parachute that's the size of a, a small warehouse. Uh, and so we see it and begin to try to inflate. Uh, we don't quite fully get there, uh, but <clears throat> I mean, that's why we're doing these kinds of tests. And so we're going to have a, a ton of data to, to pour over and try to understand uh, you know, what all we, we saw, what all happened, and to get ready again for next year. So we've got, you know, I keep mentioning next year, obviously we've got a lot of things on the horizon. Uh, we get to come back and do this test twice more uh, and really try to, to, to get these technologies and get the data on these technologies. Uh, but even before we do that, we've got more testing that we're doing on the ground. We have uh, rocket sled testing on an entirely different side configuration coming up uh, towards this fall. We also have more ground-based parachute testing that we'll be doing, uh, some wind tunnel testing and also some strength testing, uh, the latter, again, using our rocket sled uh, that we've developed uh, with our, our colleagues at China Lake. Uh, obviously, you know, the test vehicle, the test itself is, is phenomenal and it's, it's extremely exciting. Uh, but none of this is really possible without the, the team of engineers and technicians and, and analysts that we have uh, here at JPL and across NASA and with our, our contractors and partners with the Navy uh, and elsewhere. Just a, a phenomenal group. And you can watch the, the last video that I have, the third video, uh, and you can even hear just how smooth and calm and, and professional everything was going. What's not shown is me in a very different building, jumping up and down, deciding if I can sit or stand, and my leg bouncing everywhere. Um, but you also get to see how excited the team is when we finally get to, to do this test. It's a, a long, long time coming, a lot of uh, hard work, and it's just phenomenal. Uh, and with that, I guess we can go to any questions. Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, we'll open it up for questions. Again, if you have a question for any of our speakers, please hit star one on your phone. And just to, to double back, the videos that were talked to just now are available online at http colon slash slash go dot usa dot gov slash nine f b g numeric nine capital F capital B capital G. And our first question will be from Bill Harwood of CBS News. Bill? Hey, thanks a lot. Um, do you got, first of all, the, when your chute deployed, uh, just to verify you were at the proper conditions you expected the vehicle to be at when, when the, blow, the deploy occurred. And the second question was, do you yet know whether there was a tear in the chute, if the lines were, uh, it, I couldn't tell if it inflated at all or what might cause a partial inflation. Any light you can shed on that? Thanks. Uh, this is Ian Clark at JPO. Um, we we have early, you know, the preliminary indication that we have is really just from the, you know, what we're looking at the live telemetry stream, and then also the telemetered video. Uh, the rest of the the data in the video uh, is something that we still have to look into. So with regards to the test conditions, uh, we don't know exactly the test conditions precisely uh, that we hit, but we are certainly in the the region that we expected to be in. Uh, and, and in terms of the, the lines tangling, uh, you know, we're watching the same video. Uh, we have a number of, of ideas, but until we get a chance to actually look at the, the video, uh, particularly some of the high-speed and high-resolution video, uh, we won't know for sure. Yeah, that's why, as is Mark, we're very anxious to get out and get that video off the boat today and uh, start, start pulling it down. It'll probably take us a week or two to, to fully get it um, analyzed and, and a little bit longer to understand exactly what happened. And so we're very anxious to, to see what happened and see exactly what the test conditions were. And also we're recovering the we recovered the parachute itself. And so we can look in great detail at the parachute and see, see what happened to it. Okay, thanks. Again, if you have any questions for our speakers, please hit star one and you'll be added to the queue. Uh, we'll now take a question from Mark Crow of Aviation Week. Mark? Oh, thank you very much. I, I think you said this, but <clears throat> if you could be clear, have you do you have the black box that uh, has all the data recording that you were seeking after the flight? 
and I wonder if you might preview um, uh, the flight test that you're planning uh, next summer as best you can, just conceptually. Would they be launches uh, as you did this time with something else added or subtracted, or, or how would you continue the progress? Uh, this is Ian Clark, JPL. Uh, yes, we did recover the uh, our, our our black boxes, the the high speed and high resolution imagery. Uh, we recovered everything. We got the parachute. We got the test vehicle. We got the pilot balloon. Uh, we got the balloon. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal job by the recovery team uh, in getting all this stuff back. And so, uh, you know, it, we've got a lot to to look at. Um, in terms of previewing next year, the, the two tests, the first one will likely be very similar to this. Uh, we're going to be testing the, the SIAD-R configuration that we tested this time, uh, and we'll be testing the parachute again. The third test uh, is, is slated to be a test of an entirely new SIAD configuration, something even larger than what we just tested, uh, moving from 18 to beyond 20, 8-meter uh, diameter, very different design, uh, but one that we think has potential to grow uh, larger still. Um, and those will be in the, the summer, in the June, July, and August time frame of next year. Thanks, Ian. Again, if anyone has any questions for our speakers, please hit star 1, and you'll be added to the queue. As a reminder, this call will be available for instant replay and playback at 800-395-7443. And the videos being discussed today are available online at http colon slash slash go dot usa dot gov slash numeric nine capital F capital B capital G. Uh, we'll now take a question from Irene Klotz of Reuters. Irene? Thanks very much. Um I guess this is for uh, uh for Dr. Clark. Um what uh what was the condition of the L D S D in the water, it seemed like it would have been a pretty high impact. Uh, this is Ian Clark, JPL again. Uh, it was the the vehicle was intact, uh, even though the the chute didn't perform 100% uh, as expected. Uh, even a device that large back there is still generating a fair amount of drag. So uh, the vehicle may have hit the water going. Uh, between, say, 20 and 30 miles an hour, but uh, it was still intact when we were able to recover it. In fact, I've seen images of, of some of the recovery team actually sitting on the vehicle helping pull off some of the, uh, the elements and hooking it up to be pulled out of the water. So uh, it works great. Thanks. And um, for anybody who wants to answer this, you know, there's a uh, – the whole idea of, of how to get to Mars is kind of back in – uh, the limelight again in late of the National Research Council report, and I'm wondering if there is any um, kind of specific mission down the road that you think this technology uh, will be used for, or is it um, still in just kind of a um, just a, a grouping of things that NASA is looking at? Hi, yeah, this is Mark. So we we are developing this technology so that it can be used by future projects. The idea, in fact, that one of the best things about this uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate that we're being funded by NASA is that they, they are able to develop technologies that, uh, that uh, some particular project today is not directly dependent on. One of the issues we've had with previous projects is when we try and develop technologies in the context of a project, it can cause great difficulties because there's great uncertainties in these sort of developments. And so it, it greatly improves the schedule and cost of a, of a future project by developing these technologies ahead of time so that it enables future projects, it allows future projects to take on the technology without, without incredible risk. And, in fact, we do plan to have this technology available for use by the 2020 Mars mission, uh, which is going to put a rover on Mars to collect samples. Uh, they do not currently need the technology, but if, they, if their mass of their rover grows or other things, they have this as an option uh, in their project plan to say if we need to, to incorporate this parachute and if LDSD is successful in its demonstration of the parachute, then we have the ability to swap out our parachute for this one. For later missions, there may be Mars sample return missions or other larger robotic missions on the surface that will need to use both the side and the parachute. And further down the road, as we've talked about before, this is one of one, a first step of many in developing the kinds of technology 
technologies we will need to be able to put people on Mars, where we have to put much larger masses. We put a one-ton rover on Mars uh, about two years ago. Uh, this technology will enable us to put two to two and a half tons on Mars. We expect to develop more technologies in the future to ramp up eventually to 15 to 20 tons or more on the surface of Mars, which is what we'll need to put down the, the habitats and the return rockets for a human mission. And I'll let Dorothy answer further about, about other technologies. Um, yes, Irene, this is Dorothy Rasco with Space Technology Mission Directorate. Um, this test and the activity, it addresses one of the top, it addresses the top three technologies identified in the recent NRC human spaceflight report. Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, if you have any questions for our speakers, please hit star one, and we'll add you to the Q&A queue. Uh, also, the call will be available for re replay today at 800-395-7443, and the videos being discussed are available at http colon slash slash go dot usa dot gov slash numeric nine capital F capital B capital G. And we'll now take another question from Mark Rowe. Mark, hey Dave, um, I was I'm wondering if you can can discuss the challenges of preparing a, a parachute of this size under those conditions that uh, it saw during the flight uh, for ground testing. And if the, if it, I know it's just a few hours after the test, but are there some things that you're thinking about adding to your um, uh, your, your list of ground test um, um, options to to go forward next summer. This is uh, Ian Clark, JPL. So I, I think your first question was with relation to, you know, how do you prepare a parachute of this size for ground testing? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the way that we typically do ground testing, you know, particularly structural testing to make sure the parachute's strong enough is we put the parachute in a wind tunnel. Uh, for the Mars Science Laboratory, we put the parachute in the world's largest wind tunnel, the 80 by 120 foot wind tunnel up at the NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, and we turned on the wind and cranked it up and, and put 70,000 pounds of force on it. Uh, our parachute is significantly larger than the MSL parachute, and there's no wind tunnel in the world big enough, so we devised a, an entirely new test technique. And I think uh, some videos for that are, are on the Internet as well, where we use a helicopter to carry it to 4,500 feet altitude, release the parachute from the helicopter. Uh, the parachute begins inflating, but there's a, a very strong rope attached to the parachute that goes down to the ground 4,500 feet below, wraps around a pulley, and is tied to the back of a rocket sled. So once we see the parachute inflated, we light the rockets. The rocket sled accelerates horizontally, uh, and it pulls the parachute towards the ground to generate uh, over 100,000 pounds of drag force on it, uh, something that, that a test technique that hasn't existed before, but which we uh, had to develop in order to, to test technologies of this size. Um, I think your second question was related to, are there, uh, ex maybe I'll have you repeat it rather than guess. <laughs> yeah, I just wondered if you had some uh, thoughts on um, s some ways to um, add to the testing regime before you launch again. I, I guess that sort of involves first troubleshooting what may have occurred with the parachute, but um, I, you know, I, I'm not sure whether there are other options available to you to you know put some even more rigor into what what happens when the parachute deploys before you launch again. Uh, I think you you probably answered your, your question, which is the first step is we really want to understand what we saw and and what we think happened. Uh, once we have that in our heads, then we can start moving out with uh, you know things that we may want to try differently. Yeah, in fact, that's precisely why we scheduled this flight to be a year before the other two flights so that we could get this experience and we would have the time to try and incorporate whatever we learned from what happened. As Ian pointed out, we don't yet know exactly the conditions the parachute was facing. Uh, we don't know what, uh, what, what exactly the, the, the parachute inflation uh, event was or what happened to the parachute, but we're getting all that back, and within days we should know a tremendous amount more than we, than we know right now, just uh, 24 hours or, you know, or less than 24 hours after the test. By the way, if you want to see the video that uh, Ian was talking about, you can just search on YouTube for LDSD We Break for Mars, and you'll see an LDSD We Break for Mars Part 1, and you can see that, that ground test architecture that we have. And so we're planning to do one of those tests, in fact, in November on the same parachute configuration or modified slightly based on what we learned from this flight. Thank you. Thanks. Again, if you have any questions for our speakers, please hit star 1. Uh, we'll now take a question from Bill Harwood. CBS. 
Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, two quick ones for me, and I may have just missed this, but for Ian, I guess. What was the predicted drag force on the chute at altitude at Mach 4? I mean, at your, I mean Mach 2 and a half, your actual flight conditions. And man, my second question is real simple. When you said impact of 20 to 30 miles an hour, is it miles per hour or meters per second? I, I'm confused from the way the commentary was going yesterday. Thanks. Uh, the... Sorry, I was, I've already answered the second question in my head. What was the first question? <laughs> what was the predicted drag force on the right. chute at flight conditions? It, and it, you may have already said that, and I just missed it. I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, uh, it, the parachute itself was, was very experimental, and we had a range of estimates in terms of how much drag it could be producing and a range of estimates that uh, what conditions we would be delivering it to. Uh, those ranges varied from uh, predict, producing between 40,000 and upwards of 65,000 pounds of drag. Uh, the amount of force generated by the parachute in this test was was actually less important than seeing the aerodynamics, the behavior, the drag coefficients, uh, how it inflated, how it performed, that kind of stuff. Uh, the, because of the, the conditions we have to test at, the supersonic conditions, you can't match all of the right test conditions in terms of Mach number, Reynolds number, dynamic pressure to get all of the aerodynamics and the structural components all at once. So we typically decompose that problem and we'll do the aerodynamics tests uh, in, a, in a venue like what we did yesterday and we'll do the structural tests on the ground. Uh, your second question was about the, the impact velocity. Sorry? Yeah, uh, about the impact velocity. Um, what you heard, uh, the last measurement I think that we had of the descent on the uh, the parachute was still at, at several thousand, 10,000 or 15,000 feet altitude, and at that time it was going about 20 meters per second. Uh, I'm extrapolating a little bit and guessing that by the time it got to the water, uh, it was probably around 20 to 30 miles an hour, but we don't have the data yet to, to say for sure. Okay, thanks a lot. That's all I needed. Okay, again, if you have any questions, we'll have a last call for questions with star one. Uh, this call will be available for replay at 800-395-7443, and the videos being discussed today are available at http colon slash slash go dot usa dot gov slash numeric nine capital F capital B capital G. Uh, and we'll take a call from a question from Max Cherney of Vice Media. Max. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, first, congratulations on a successful test. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Uh, it was really cool. We're, um, our readers are really excited about this. Um, my, my question is, is uh, I've got a, a kind of a fundamental one, and it's just why, why this particular um, test vehicle? Uh, you know, it, the, this was uh, described as a flying saucer, and there's a lot of talk about that, and I'm just curious why, why this particular um, test vehicle was appropriate to test a shoot. The, uh, the test vehicle was, first question, why this particular test vehicle? Uh, when we go to Mars, we typically use very large blunt body entry vehicles, and so the test vehicle we have was meant to simulate uh, the entry vehicle that we would have when we use these technologies at Mars. Uh, it's very important to match uh, the interfaces that exist, the way that the, the technologies would be attached and installed and interact with the vehicle uh, in the same way that they would for a Mars mission. Okay, well, uh, there are no more questions, so we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. Again, thanks, everyone, for joining us for today's post-flight telecon. If you want to learn more about how NASA is investing in space technology and how technology drives exploration, feel free to visit us online at www.nasa.gov slash space tech and continue to follow the LDSD progress and mission via their website as we update it with new data as data becomes available. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and have a great weekend. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.